everyone, and it's a great delight for us uh, to meet again with our invisible audience, uh, with our precious church members and their relatives and friends and children at uh, Cranburn and East Paran and Pakenham, as well as the greater Christian community in our precious country and especially in Melbourne. I would like to especially thank uh, those of our members and guests who are the battlefront, who are the army, uh, who are saving and protecting and shielding us from the coronavirus. I want to thank our doctors, and we have a number of them in our congregations. I want to thank our nurses, and we have many. Uh, you are our true heroes. I want to thank uh, people who are looking after nursing homes. Uh, you know that the aged care outbreak of COVID-19 in Melbourne has been uh, a major one, and hundreds of people, unfortunately, in the aged care facilities passed away. Uh, we have our brother and elder, Diogo Rocha, today presenting to us, and uh, he's been dealing with this uh, right in the middle of it, and in a number of nursing homes in the southwest and also in Geelong, uh, in Melbourne. And Diogo, thank you very much for uh, your truly heroic work. And we thank everyone. I want to thank our ADRA team, our welfare team, uh, a large number of volunteers who have been faithfully helping tons and tons of people uh, across this vast community with their basic needs. Our precious hero, Debbie Fricke, our ADRA coordinator. Debbie, we thank you. We know that you're doing it tough. Uh, I just want to let everyone know that Debbie uh, has already had three leg fractures in the past six months. She had a fracture uh, probably four or five months ago from which she recovered. And unfortunately, just a few days ago, because of, a, uh, of an unexpected fall, she again, had a fracture in, uh, a foot, in her foot and in her ankle and is in a wheelchair at home. Uh, we want to ask you, please pray for these people. Uh, we know that ADRA has been our major and main mission field and uh, the evil one, Lucifer, who doesn't want the word of God to spread around the world, he's trying to strike right in the heart and, in, and he's trying to touch with his evil nasty hands, our ADRA coordinator. Uh, I'm asking you, brothers and sisters, please rebuke the evil one by your prayers. Overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and let the glory of Christ shine in our lives and in our hearts. When I'm finished preaching, I will spend some time uh, answering your questions. And you may ask uh, very sharp, provocative and very difficult questions today. Uh, we will dedicate 20 minutes from midday until 12.20, and we are going to have a very nice discussion. I will ask you to send your questions to me via a text message uh, to my mobile number, which is 04-2395-1958. Well, we are now going to travel into the biblical world. And again, let's say, say another word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are praying for the country of Australia and uh, our sister country of New Zealand, uh, that you will destroy the coronavirus in these lands as well as the rest of the world. And uh, we will not cease to pray for the healing of those who are sick, uh, for those who lost their job, uh, for the governments of our countries, for the economic recovery of our lands, Lord, please come to our aid. We need you. But most of all, we need the gospel to go around the world and finish its proclamation. And uh, we are desperate to see the reality of the second coming of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning we are going to talk about surviving the storm. We're going to go to the gospel of Mark. It's a very vibrant gospel. Unlike Matthew of 28 chapters and Luke, uh, the gospel of 24 chapters and uh, the great gospel of John 21 chapters, the gospel of Mark is the shortest. And uh, the authorship of this gospel is attributed to Peter. 
uh, one of the first leaders of the early church. And uh, we know that the gospel is short, but it has a lot of charisma in it, a lot of character. Uh, you can see Peter's personality who is moving, who is on the go, uh, who is uh, there to proclaim the good news to uh, the population in Rome. And it is for this reason that in the Gospel of Mark, you find a lot of translations of Hebrew phrases uh, so that the Roman audience could understand what it all means, what Jesus said when he said, Talitha kumi, little girl, I, I tell you rise. Or Eloi, Eloi lama sabachani, which is my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Well, today we're going to look at a paragraph in Luke chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. On the, the same day, when evening had come, he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along in the boat as, as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind, wind ceased, and there was a great calm. But he said to them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? So this is the text we're going to explore. And uh, gentlemen, if you don't mind, uh, turning on my blue microphone, I'm going to draw some things on the whiteboard. By the way, I would like to wholeheartedly thank our audiovisual team, uh, Graham Willen and Paul Butov. Thank you, gentlemen, for making uh, this provision for the whole church to watch our services in the past six months. So here we are. Uh, this is the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the eastern shores. And uh, be between the shore of the Mediterranean, there is the great river Jordan. Uh, it outlets into what we call the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is the area where we believe uh, Sodom and Gomorrah were located. In the north... The river Jordan goes out of the Lake of Galilee, or in biblical times it was called the Sea of Galilee. It's a large lake. I've been uh, to this lake for the first time in 1997. It was March, it was the rain season, and uh, our group of pastors and our tour guide, we took to this lake, a uh, nice day, clear skies, and, of course, we wanted to go and actually swim in the lake. When we dove in, I realized that the lake was as cold as Lake Baikal in Siberia. It was freezing. I swam for a minute, and then I uh, jumped back on the shore. And then I said, well, I have to go there three times because God likes number three. So I went the second time maybe for another minute, then the third time for another minute, and that was it. The water was very cold. Uh, generally speaking, throughout the year, the Lake of Galilee is fairly cold. And only in good summertime in Israel, in, uh, when it's very, very hot, you can go and swim there very safely. So the, here we are on the Lake of Galilee, and it is uh, in the radius of about 10 kilometers around Lake Galilee 
that uh, you find most of the events of the Gospels. You find Jesus everywhere. You find the, him in the Decapolis, uh, which is uh, an area of ten cities. You find him in the city of Jerusalem. You find him born south of Jerusalem in the uh, city of Bethlehem. You find him in the Judean desert. However, most of the events, his healings, miracles, his preaching, the Sermon on the Mount, you find all of those things uh, in Galilee. This was the birthplace of the teaching of Jesus. His parables were recorded here. Uh, many other things. Well, it is here that uh, Jesus spends the whole day teaching a large multitude of people. And uh, you see that he's there on the boat, and there are many other boats, because uh, in those days they did not have the power amplifying systems. Jesus had to speak out loud. Uh, he had sometimes to cry and yell when it was windy, and uh, he had to uh, beat all other noises because people came with their families, little children. I don't think those kids were always noiseless. Yet the crowd was excited about the teaching of Christ. And on that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let, let's cross over to the other side. Jesus would often cross over to the other side so that on the other side, in the absence of large crowds, he could spend some time in solitude, alone, praying and talking and communicating with his, uh, with his Father. That was a very nice time. And in verse 36, you find these words. Now, when they had left the multitude, they took him along on, uh, in the boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. Well, for those days, this was a high technology innovation. People were accustomed to go to the synagogues and uh, several times a year uh, travel to Jerusalem, to the temple, to hear about the Word of God. And in this case, uh, ha something happened which uh, a lot of people did not expect. Jesus was a rabbi, and most rabbis were expected to teach in the synagogue or in a learning school next to the synagogue. In our case, Jesus takes the gospel outside of the religious house, dome, or sphere. He takes it to the world of nature. And there he is in a boat. His boat becomes a pulpit, and there's a crowd on the bank of the lake, and there are crowds in many boats. There are many fishermen who own those boats, and they're all listening to him. In verse 37, you find these words. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat, so that it was already filling. So as Jesus and his disciples are crossing the lake, and it could be in some places a couple kilometers, a long distance, suddenly there is a windstorm. It's interesting to notice that in the Gospel of Matthew, and by the way, uh, all of the three synoptic evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they mention this story, and they give us different detail, details of the story and different flavors to it. Uh, Matthew actually says that there was an earthquake. So there was uh, not just the storm because of the wind. Yes, the wind came. But there was an earthquake. The earth shook. We know that that area in ancient times had some seismic activity, but not a lot. So the earthquake catches people by surprise. And it seems that all the powers of nature are there to destroy the disciples and the boat and Jesus. The earth is shaking. The winds, mighty winds are blowing. The waves are roaring. The boat is filling. And when it fills, it will drown. So you find despair, fear in the minds and the personalities of his disciples. And here we are, and the great windstorm arose, and the waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on a pillow. 
And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So on one hand, we see the demonic forces, the evil forces trying to destroy Jesus and his disciples, just like the evil forces are trying to spread the coronavirus around the world and destroy as many people as possible, shut the borders and the economies of many countries, stop the preachers from, from crossing those borders, going and preaching the gospel to those who are lost. Uh, we know that throughout history, in the course of the great controversy, the evil forces of Lucifer have been trying to stop the preaching of the word. On multiple occasions, Lucifer was trying to drown Jesus. And Jesus is here asleep. Maybe this is his chance. Maybe this is the golden opportunity to destroy Jesus as well as his disciples. To drown everything so that people on the shore will just forget in a time. And that will be it. Besides Calvary, besides the crucifixion, you find many occasions when Jesus and his disciples were on the brink of disaster. Second to perishing. And the disciples, as you and I see, they are uh, appealing to Jesus. In Mark, they're calling him teacher, rabbi, rabbi in ancient Hebrew language. Luke tells us, as he describes this, that they were calling him master. Master, Matthew says, Lord. So the fact that the different gospel writers uh, record different titles and names by which the disciples were calling Jesus, some said teacher, others said master, others said Lord, it means that they are very desperate. They are very desperate. They are calling him all the great names that he deserves in order to wake him up. Just think about the disciples. The vast majority of them were fishermen and spent most of their lives on the Lake of Galilee. Uh, Many of them uh, were fishing. Their fathers were fishing. Their grandfathers were fishing. And uh, and as we know, fishermen are tough people. They're tough and rough. They're not afraid of storms and waves. They're good swimmers. And uh, they are used to any kind of calamity. So obviously, from the context here, we realize that the disaster they were facing surpassed anything they could dream of or imagine. It was a life-threatening situation when even the most experienced swimmers realized they're up to be dead very, very soon. And here we are, when all the professionalism has failed, when all the experience of the people of the great waters have failed and they are pleading and begging for salvation. And in verse 39, you and I find these words. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Jesus wakes up, and he's there on the stern. He's in what we would call a VIP section, and he is so tired. Why is he asleep as they're crossing the lake? Why is he asleep even when there's so much turbulence? Well, he is tired. Jesus is exhausted. In spite of the fact that he is the Son of God, God in human flesh, He's still God in human flesh, subject to tiredness, exhaustion, and feelings and emotions that you and I share. He is there just like you and me. And then he says, peace. In Hebrew language, shalom, peace, be still. This beautiful word you find throughout many biblical passages, even today in the Jewish tradition, It's one of the most favorite words amongst the Jewish people. When they greet each other in the streets of modern Israel, they tell each other, Shalom, peace. They were desperate to have peace for so many years. 
Jesus when he rises from the dead. And when he comes to his disciples on the day of resurrection in the, in the upper room where they are in doubt, thinking that all their hopes had been buried, he says, peace be unto you. Again, this beautiful Hebrew word, shalom. And there he is, telling the waters and the wind and the quaking earth, shalom, peace, be still. And the Bible says, there was a great calm. Where Christ is, there's always a great calm. Not just calm, great calm. Where, when Jesus comes, he brings with himself the great calm. In verse 40, he's asking his disciples a question, but he said to them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? I'm not surprised why he's asking his disciples this question. How much do humans need to be persuaded about the power of God and the power of Jesus? And we know that those disciples, they had been witnesses of many of his miracles. When he raised the dead, when he uh, destroyed the demons, when he uh, threw them out in, in the waters with the herd of pigs, they saw him heal, they uncurable people, clean leprosy, open the eyes of the blind. And they've seen those miracles on a daily basis, day after day, day after day, day after day. I think if I were amongst them, I would probably never even question his power. But in this case, you see uh, the horrible features of human nature. Human nature gives up so quickly. Human nature gives in so fast. Even, uh, and it's a good message for all of us, if you walk with Christ all your life and you witness Him working in your life every day, but if you give up on your relationship with Christ, you may end up in turbulent waters or winds very, very quickly. And you may end up in despair. And Jesus asking you a question, why is it that you have so little faith? In verse 41, and they, hear, and they uh, feared exceedingly and said to one another, Who can this be, that even the wind and the sea obey him? So here in verse 41, they're still in doubt. They still have fear. And we know that they'll need many, many years. And finally, the Calvary, the death of Jesus for our sins, and his resurrection to be absolutely 100% convinced about his messiahship, that he is the true messiah, the anointed one, sent by God, the fulfillment of all prophecies, the great desire of ages. They will need a lot of time. Yet here, they, like many others, accept the fact that Jesus is not only the great messiah, he is also the creator. Sometimes, he seems so simple, so fragile. This carpenter, this smart and very skilled and talented, very clever carpenter from Nazareth, the one who surprised the rabbis at the age of 12 in the temple. And sometimes the creative power comes on the surface. And the sea and the winds, the waters, everything in this world obeys him. No wonder why Jesus, when he parted with them on the day of his ascension, said, all power, all authority in heaven and on earth are given to me. It will be Jesus who will tell his disciples, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations, and uh, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this is the paragraph that you and I are reading today. 2,000 years ago, and we see that Jesus and his disciples peacefully, uneventfully, without any dire consequences, survived the storm. 
And I believe that this passage, if shifted to our time, is a very, very relevant for you and me today. It's the most relevant passage that you and I can find in connection to the great COVID-19 pandemic. And here we are in Melbourne, barely out of the second wave of the, of the coronavirus. Many, many more weeks and maybe months still in stage four restrictions, gradually, slowly easing. We, as a community, have been under a very liberal form of, I would call it even house arrest for many months. And we had too many things to learn and many things to unlearn. Luckily, Australia is not so big on coronavirus. We know that around the world, it's accelerating, it's growing in geometrical progression. Look at the United States with over 7 million cases. 200,000 precious Americans died. They've just reported that even the President of the United States of America is now sick and has been taken to hospital uh, for, for the COVID-19 treatment. Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom had a similar experience. We don't know how much uh, Vladimir Putin and his bunker in Moscow will be able to be safe from this. We know that his press secretary has been sick. Uh, around the world, this virus has not been sparing anyone. Politicians, military personnel, tradesmen, young and old. Now, over 30 million people infected, with many more undetected. We are in the middle of a storm, a giant storm, economically, socially, politically. We know that a lot of countries today are, uh, are in a conflict with each other. We know that racism is back. We know that nationalism is back around the world. The world is in turmoil. The world is in the storm. And you and I have this clear message. The only one who can calm the storm, when it will be great calm, is Jesus Christ. No contact tracing, however good it is, will solve the problem. No masks will be able to solve the problem. They'll probably give us 60 to 70% safety chance of not contracting the coronavirus. We know that all human efforts around the world will do their best to stop the pandemic. The scientists are testing and testing and testing, digging into, not leaving their microscopes, inspections, experiments around the world to find this magic vaccine which would help us create a population shield against the coronavirus. But again, ultimately, at the end of the day, it's only Jesus Christ who can help you and I survive this storm. Just think of the times in your life's experience when you were in the middle of the storm and Christ comes and helps you survive the storm. I remember like in 2006, uh, I was invited to travel to India with an American-Australian team. At that time, I and my family lived in Russia, and uh, I worked as, uh, as a church pastor, and my wife was working as uh, the union evangelist. And uh, I went to India for the first time. It was a remarkable experience. Uh, when we landed in Hyderabad, and I got out of the plane, and for the first time in my life, I felt... Uh, how difficult it is to breathe in India because of the tropical climate and the high humidity. For me, a Siberian by birth who is so used to cold weather, uh, India was at first uh, uh, a weather shock, a nature shock. And then we traveled uh, from Hyderabad to Vishakhapatnam, and uh, I had to uh, preach in one village area uh, and uh, about probably 70 kilometers south of Vishakhapatnam, we took 11 villages, and there we were preaching to those people and teaching the gospel. In the mornings, we would visit people from door to door, from home to home. In the evenings, uh, 11 or 12 trucks would bring over a 1,000 people to our meetings, and we would keep preaching and teaching, believing that 
the great work of, God, of Christ would advance all over India and this amazing land would receive Jesus. Well, the storms came in about a week and a half. There was an organization in India called Vishwa Hindu Parishad, uh, VHP, uh, which uh, exists for the sole purpose of preventing India from becoming Christian. It's an organization which uh, will go to the governments, negotiate uh, so that Christian missionaries would not get permissions to uh, run their meetings and preach. And in some cases, some extremists would even kill Christians. So there was this organization which went to the local government and uh, there were threats. We had to take off all the symbols and all the posters uh, we had. We had to take uh, all the signage from our cars because we were told that we were not safe. It was around the same time that I received a call from my wife, Helena, and she was in the Ural Mountains running evangelistic meetings in two cities, Novotroisk and Orsk. And uh, in Novotroisk, where she had a good crowd of people, about 300 people coming regularly to a rented cinema, uh, that evening when she was about to preach about Christ in prophecy, it's, it's uh, Helen's most favorite topic, Christ in prophecy, there was a fire inside the cinema. No one has ever found the reason, but the, the hall was set on fire. Luckily, the fire department was not far, and the firefighters uh, rushed quickly and uh, extinguished the flames. But can you imagine that evening? The hall is flooded with water because the firefighters uh, probably used a couple big cisterns, uh, two full fire trucks, uh, put water into the hall, and the hall is like a swimming pool. Uh, the water is up to your knees. And outside, it's cold. It's about 25 degrees below zero outside. It's winter time. And uh, the Ural Mountains, it's very cold, just like Siberia. And that evening, the little team of, of Helen arrives there. They look around and they're asking a question, what shall we do? Because they uh, turned off the heating system in the hall for the duration of the fire extinguishing, and so the hall is cold. There's water everywhere. It's impossible to walk around. And uh, the little team decided, whatever happens, we're going to preach because the people will come. The people did not know that there was a fire and uh, there's still smoke in the building, uh, this horrible smell of burnt furniture, burnt walls, uh, panels. And uh, the local pastor said, let's put a table uh, right there on, uh, in front of the stage. And let's put Helen on top of the table so that she will not have her feet wet. And we will make sure that people, when they get on their seats, that they raise their legs on top. And somehow the audience will be able to listen until the water is drained by tomorrow. So in the evening, the audience started arriving. Uh, at first, as people entered, the building is full of smoke. There has just been fire. And as they enter... They are advised to walk on uh, wood boards and bricks uh, leading to their seats, and they are suggested that they will raise their feet high and sometimes put them on the seats in front of them. So they, will, they were all sitting as if they were at a party. Helen was placed there on the table, and in the middle of that smoke, uh, in such horrible post-fire conditions, she preached to them, that Christ is the Lord, and all prophecies were fulfilled in his life. If I were amongst those people, I would think if I were to come the next day, because the hall looked ugly. It was burnt through. Would you come back? Well, the people kept coming back. And at the end of that program, 67 precious souls were baptized. It was the miracle of miracles. In spite of all the hardships, people gave their lives to Christ. Back in India, I was about to leave because we were told to leave early. And we managed to have our baptisms. And in the area where I was preaching in the villages, every day the local pastor went to the waters to baptize people. Uh, and as I left, 1,000 
305 souls were baptized in those 11 villages, and a number of new churches were planted. The Lord is good to us. There was a storm, but the Lord was kind. Let me uh, share with you just another little story of what happened to us on one night when I was to preach about baptism. So there we are, uh, driving to, uh, to our venue, about 70 kilometers from where we live. And uh, as we arrive at our playground where we put chairs and carpets and the stage, I see that a group of our Indian friends are doing something uh, around the big tractor. And the tractor was, uh, was our generator of power. We had a big tractor engine which we used to generate electricity and power the microphones, the floodlights, because in the evening in India it's very, very dark, especially in the village areas. And I'm asking uh, my, the local church pastor, what's happening? And he said, don't worry, don't worry, it's a little problem. I see in Indian culture, uh, uh, they're not used to talk about negative things uh, very openly and uh, very uh, outspokenly. Uh, they will tell, it's a little problem, we'll fix it. Uh, so, uh, because they respect me, they don't want to frighten me, they're very nice to me. Uh, for them, it's an act of kindness. They want to be nice and kind to me. And, uh, and then as I approached, I, I checked the engine, and I said, gentlemen, this engine is broken completely. It's not going to work. Oh, don't worry, we'll fix it, we'll fix it. So, uh, and several of our brothers are frankly, uh, t- frantically trying to fix the engine, disassemble this part, reassemble, disassemble this part, reassemble. The darkness comes. And uh, we're asking the question, shall we have a meeting tonight? And then I gave them a suggestion. Gentlemen, why don't we connect to, say, the power lines that run along the road? And they said, no, 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 no. We shouldn't do this because uh, you'll get to jail in India for one year for that. I said, well, you know, it's only for an hour. You see, my brothers and sisters, at that time I was not Australian yet. I was Russian. Anyway, they said, we'll try to connect ourselves to the village system. So we connect to the village system, turn on the floodlights, turn on the stage, the microphones, and our trucks with people are already arriving, and suddenly the lights go out in the entire valley. We consumed so much electricity that... The village people are running now to us with torches and saying, my refrigerator isn't working. Uh, My television isn't working. This is not working. Oh, I'm thinking the community will hate us for this, that we connected ourselves to the village grid. And uh, what shall we do? I told uh, the pastor, let's turn the trucks towards this ground and let them turn on their lights, headlights to the ground so that we could see and let's unload the people and see if we can have a program. And uh, as hundreds of people arrived, we realized that without the proper power amplification, we will not be able to yell out loud uh, good enough for us to preach to this whole assembly. So I said, okay, let us pray. Let the people go. And uh, after that, we'll uh, probably come tomorrow, and then we'll preach on baptism tomorrow. And then the Indian pastors approached me and they said, the deem, God will not lose in India. Just keep praying. Don't worry, we'll have a meeting. Everything will be all right. I said, but look, there's no light. We tried to fix uh, the tractor engine. We failed. We connected ourselves to the village grid and we blew up the fuse for the whole village. The village will hate us tomorrow. And they said, well, the deem, just keep believing. Believe the Lord is in charge. God, uh, you see, you're preaching on baptism tonight. And the evil one doesn't want these people to hear about baptism because he doesn't want them to be baptized. For this reason, we're out of electricity. I must confess, my brothers and sisters, I had little faith at that time. I said, well, uh, I don't know how God is going to win, but let the people back on, on the trucks and uh, let, the, let them go. As the first truck was loaded and the driver turned on the engine, about to leave, suddenly the light came back. I don't know how they managed to fix the grid. And I quickly ran to them and said, well, please, 
turn on only the microphone and a couple lights. That'll be enough for us. And the video projector so that we could project the slides on the screen. Don't turn on anything. Don't turn on the big floodlights. They consume too much electricity. And there we were, in darkness, not seeing people, just in complete darkness, pictures on the screen. The preacher and my translator, nobody could see us, but they could hear our voices. And we preached, and we prayed, and then we loaded the people on, the, on, those, on those trucks and sent them home. The Lord made a miracle. As I told you previously, 1,305 souls were baptized. In the middle of the storm, the Lord shows His grace and power. My dear friends, as we're, draw, as we're coming close to the conclusion of our presentation today, let me tell you that the storms will come, big storms like the COVID-19 one and little storms. It could be a breakdown in your life and personality. We know that today there's a huge demand on counseling and psychological help in our community because we're so unused to these calamities. Maybe, my friend, you're having a storm in your family. And we know that through the lockdown, family violence rose. And in many countries, they report the very high divorce rate. Maybe, my friend, your family is about to break up. Or it is possible that you're going through bereavement and you lost a loved one recently. And because of all the lockdowns, you couldn't even properly bury him because you couldn't invite anyone. Maybe you lost a job. It's a big thing today. You could have lost hours. You are on a partial pay. You're thinking, how will I pay my loan, my mortgage tomorrow? What shall I feed my children with? What about school? My kids go to a Christian school and they, uh, I just can't pay the fees. Or maybe you are going through persecution for faith. We could list many more storms. Well, what shall we do then? Well, this is the message from the story from the Gospel of Mark. First of all, stay in the boat. Don't leave the boat. Don't jump out of the boat. It's more dangerous out there. You may think the boat is about to sink. Don't worry, because in the boat you have Jesus in the stern. Just call on Jesus, Master, Teacher, Lord. Even if you are in despair, the Lord will understand. The Lord doesn't want you to come to Him just a good person, smiling, nice and kind. The Lord will take you in our filthy rags, in our righteousness, which is like filthy rags, in our sinfulness. He will accept us just as we are. Forgive our sins and bring healing into our lives. Where Christ is, He will bring calm, perfect, great calm into our lives. Would you like Christ to bring calm into your life? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for this gospel story. We're praying that you will bring peace and calm into our lives today and great healing in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen.